the rise and fall of the Arab state uh, exactly the last century. And I, I would start uh, my comments first by saying something about uh, the Middle East. We speak of the Middle East uh, and we know exactly what it is that we're talking about when we talk about the Middle East. But I wonder whether people have really thought why the Middle East is called the Middle East. It doesn't really make any sense. If you live in Tel Aviv or in Cairo or in uh, Istanbul, that is not the middle or the east of anything. Yet all the peoples of the Middle East, Arabs, Jews, Turks, uh, Persians, we all call the region the Middle East, even though this is a name given to the region by foreigners. It is the Middle East only if you look at it from Paris or from London or from Washington. Then it is that Middle East on the way to the Far East. The fact that we have no name for our own region and call it by the name given to it by foreigners is indicative of the unusual influence that foreign powers had in the Middle East for uh, much of the 19th and the 20th centuries. And it is foreign powers, as we will see, who were responsible for the creation of much of the state system in the Middle East that is now falling apart at the seams. The last 200 years, that is well before 1915, and when we talk about the modern Middle East, essentially the point where we begin usually is the Napoleonic invasion of Egypt in 1798. So essentially we're talking about the last 200 years of the Middle East and the West. This Western impact over the Middle East, which comes as a result of the Muslims' recognition that the West is ahead of them. This became very clear as a result of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic invasion of Egypt, leading to what some historians call the breaking down of the walls of self-sufficiency of the Muslim world. The Muslims until then believed that they were a superior civilization, that they had nothing to learn from the West. The West was a world of barbarians. By the way, in a parenthesis, I will say, the Twin Towers, ISIS in Paris, is the rage and the fury of a civilization in retreat. That is, in a nutshell, what it is all about. And the Western impact of the 19th century led to the breaking down of these walls of self-sufficiency, as, as they were called, particularly in one dramatic, influential field, the world of ideas. Ideas are more dangerous than occupation. Occupation comes and goes. Ideas may remain forever. And it is this clash with the world of Western ideas that put in motion the process that still continues today, the struggle between the forces of modernity and change that define the Middle East as we know it. That is what it was about in the 19th century. That's what it is about now. And in these forces of change in the world of ideas was particularly one of great influence, the idea of nationalism. The idea that collective identity was primarily about language and territory and not religion. That is a foreign idea to the Muslim world where people were defined for centuries upon centuries by their religious belief. You were either a Muslim or something else. The intellectual sources of Arab nationalism were two. One was Christian intellectuals who found it relatively easy to adopt ideas from the West, who wanted to promote an idea other than Islam for collective identity as Christians, as a minority in the Muslim world. Arab nationalism was much more convenient. If you define people by their language, then Muslims and Christians are equal. If people are defined by religion, then Muslims are superior to Christians. So Christians had an interest in the promotion of the idea of Arab nationalism. Muslims would not buy the idea from Christians, obviously. And there was a movement 
of Islamic reform, which spoke in the 19th century of the necessity to find some kind of intellectual compromise between Islam and the West. And the conclusion they came to was that Islam in its original state in the seventh century was the perfect form of Islam. And if Muslims would only return to the seventh century type of Islam, they would find their equality with the West. That meant returning to Islam of the Arabs. It was the Arabs who brought greatness to Islam, not the Persians and not the Turks. So Arab nationalism from Christian sources and from these Muslim sources began to emerge, and by the time we get to World War I, Arab nationalism is in people's consciousness. It's on the political agenda. Comes World War I and the great powers decide that the time has come to dismantle the Ottoman Empire that chose, uh, unfortunately for them, to fight against the Western powers along with Germany and Austria. And thus begins the ideas about dismantling the Ottoman Empire. There were three sets of negotiations during World War I leading up to this dismantling of the Ottoman Empire. First, there was a negotiation which begins in 1915, and that is why our story begins in 1915. A negotiation between the British and between the Arabs as represented by the Hashemite family, those who were the rulers of the holy places in Mecca and Medina on behalf of the Ottoman Turks. The Hashemites had aspirations of their own against the Ottomans to establish an Arab empire under their rule in the Arab-speaking parts of the empire, of the Ottoman Empire, and it was on that grounds that they entered into a negotiation with the British. The British studied the idea of an Arab empire, didn't oppose it, had their reservations, but asked the Arabs to rise in rebellion against the Turks in order to get their prize at the end. And the Arabs did rise in rebellion. That is the famous Arab rebellion, Lawrence of Arabia, in the desert. It wasn't a great rebellion, and most of the Arabs didn't join the rebellion. Even Lawrence called it a sideshow of a sideshow. But nevertheless, it is the Arab rebellion and the PR of the Arab rebellion that put the Arabs on the map of the peace conference that followed the First World War. So that is one set of negotiations. The other set of negotiations was between the British and the French, the famous Sykes-Picot. The famous Sykes-Picot agreement, if you can see here, the blue A zone and the red B zone, and Palestine here in the corner, yellow. The Middle East was divided into spheres of influence. French and British, Palestine shared by the British and the French. So that was the second uh, set of negotiations. The third was the Balfour Declaration to the Zionists, promising the establishment of a Jewish national home in Palestine, in Palestine. Not the conversion of Palestine into a Jewish national home, but the establishment of a Jewish national home in Palestine. Many historians say these three sets of negotiations all contradicted each other. They didn't really. Um, but it is on the basis of these negotiations that the state system of the Middle East, as we know it today, more or less came into being. The French received the control of Lebanon and Syria. Lebanon and Syria. The British had this arc from Palestine through Transjordan, Iraq, to the Persian Gulf. One may ask why the borders were drawn the way they were. This is completely arbitrary. And it's also a result of a very strange interpower trade-off of territories where people were shifted from one place to another, one country to another, on the basis of imperial interests. Thus, Palestine, Jordan, and Iraq are three countries. This was all British mandate territory. It could have been one country. But it was divided into three because of Palestine. 
If Palestine wants to be the place of the Jewish homeland, then there had to be Transjordan for the Arabs, and Transjordan as a buffer state between Iraq, which they didn't want to have mixed up with the problem of Palestine, which they knew was already awaiting them. <clears throat> Palestine, because it was partly French, according to sykes picot became entirely British, and the French also gave the British part of Syria part of Syria, which became the Kurdish part of Iraq. This part of Iraq initially belonged to the French area of influence. But the French, in order to get control of Syria and Lebanon, which the British had to confer to them, gave up on Palestine and gave up part of Syria. So the Kurds ended up in Iraq instead of being in Syria, where they could have been today for all that matters. But what is interesting here is what the states looked like in terms of their domestic construct. Egypt is a state, and we will come back to this, which has a very homogeneous population. Egypt has a population which is almost 100% Sunni Muslim Arab. You have a small Christian minority of some 10%. But the countries of what is known as the Fertile Crescent, the Fertile Crescent is this area that goes from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean, this Fertile Crescent. The countries of the Fertile Crescent are countries, for the most part, of minorities. Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq are countries that are essentially a mosaic of different minorities, not homogeneous populations. And this is one of the major causes for the troubles we see today. Jordan, as we will see, is an exception. Jordan, which most people expected to disintegrate a long time ago, is still the most stable country in this fertile crescent because Jordan is homogeneous in terms of religion. All the Jordanians, almost, are Sunni Muslim Arabs. There are no minorities there. And we will talk about that uh, in greater detail later on. What the British believed was that this Arab nationalism was the wave of the future. Arabism would override these sectarian differences. And in the future, there would be no meaning to these sectarian religious beliefs, westernizing modernization would secularize these societies who would cease to give such importance to religion. And there was indeed, after the First World War, what I call a secularizing interlude, the 1920s, where in Egypt, for example, there was a very significant intellectual attack on tradition, where intellectuals argued that there is no place for religion in politics, and that Egypt ought to be a secular state governed by a secular society. But this secular interlude was met with the opposition of the Muslim Brethren who were formed in 1929 to counter this. And it is they who eventually won the ideological argument. But Arab nationalism became very popular for much of the 20th century because Arab nationalism was this middle ground between total secularism, territorial nationalism like Egyptianism, and Islam. Arab nationalism was, was a way of adopting a Western kind of collective identity, Arabness, like Germanness, nationality defined by language, together with a healthy respect that the Arabs maintained with their Islamic heritage. So Arab nationalism was this great middle ground, and for much of the 20th century, Arab nationalism was the victorious ideology, the creation of the Arab League, the heyday of Arab nationalism in the 1950s and the 1960s, where Nasser of Egypt represented this messianic message of power and prestige and prosperity that would follow in the wake of Arab unity and alliance with the Soviet Union, Arab socialism, all those famous slogans of the 1950s and the 1960s. There was a union between Egypt and Syria in 1958. This was a phenomenal success of Arab nationalism. But then everything crashed. The union between Syria and Egypt fell apart in 1961. Egypt sank into its Vietnam in the civil war in Yemen in the early 1960s. And then came the disaster of 1967. The defeat to Israel, which was uh, the nail in the coffin of this pan-Arabism. And the defeat in 1967 was not just a defeat in the battlefield to Israel in six days. This was 
a representation of the catastrophic failure of 150 years of Western-style modernization. The Arabs had failed in the test of modernization, and the war against Israel was proof of that. And thus, the Islamists come into the picture. They have a counter-argument. Arab nationalism, which was this aircraft carrier of secularism, was a big mistake. Look where it has led us to. Islam is the solution, not Western-style nationalism. And Islam is the solution was widely accepted by societies of the Middle East that to a very large degree remain traditionalist. The radical Islamic response was met with favor by many people in the Muslim world because tradition has been far more resilient than people thought it would be. By the way, not talking about Muslims. Look at Israel, another subject, where tradition is a lot more resilient than the Zionists initially thought. But in the radical Islamist response to the challenge of westernizing secularization, there are two kinds of Islamic response, Sunni and Shi'i. So first, a word about the difference between Sunnis and Shi'is. Where does this come from? Shia in Arabic means faction. Shia means faction. The origins of Sunnah and Shia are in the seventh century in the struggle over the succession after the Prophet Muhammad. The Shia were those who supported the, the Prophet's son-in-law, Ali, and were therefore called Shi'at Ali, the faction of Ali. This was a fight over the succession. It was all about politics. It was not about religious dogma. But Shi'at Ali lost. And the Sunnis were those who emerged victorious. And over the centuries, serious different ideologies and doctrines have developed between Sunnah and Shia. Shia is built very much around a historical narrative of oppression by the Sunnis. The Shi'is, the, their very essence, being Shiite, is built around a historical narrative of hostility to the Sunnis who defeated and suppressed them and oppressed them for centuries. So there is a built-in tension between Sunnis and Shi'is. Sunnis who fear Shiite subversion and Shiites who fear Sunni oppression. According to some Sunni radicals, the Shiites are even worse than Jews. And that is saying something. <laughs> or even worse than Jews and Christians combined. And that is saying something even larger. And there is Sunni radicalism and there is Shiite radicalism. And they are not the same. Sunni radicalism emphasizes the implementation of religious law, the Sharia. Sunnis talk about implementing the Sharia. Shiites talk about the personality of the ruler. The ruler must be of the Muslim Shiite clergy, the rule of the Ayatollahs. It must be the rule of the jurisprudent, the clergyman. So the Sunnis emphasize the law, the Shiites emphasize the personality of the ruler. This has political ramifications. There is no Sunni authority that defines exactly how the Sharia ought to be implemented. There are scores, if not hundreds, of different organizations, militias, the Muslim brethren, different uh, regimes who have their own ideas about how the law ought to be implemented. The argument within the Sunni world about the implementation of the Sharia 
is like the Hobbesian war of all against all. And you can see this in Syria, for example, how dozens of militias are partly at war with each other, partly at war with the regime. There is no agreement within the Sunni world how this is to be done. But for the Shiites, the regime in Iran, for most of them, is an accepted central authority. And they take their orders from the Shiite regime of Iran. And as a result, the Shiites in the war between Shiites and Sunnis are much more united than the Sunnis are. And the breakup of the Sunni world is breaking up these countries. Islamic politics encourages sectarianism. If you speak about Sunni radicalism and the implementation of Sunni religious law, you are excluding the Christians, you are excluding the Shiites, and essentially by taking the course of Islamic radicalism, you are enforcing upon all other communities to close up within their own shells of their sectarian identity. Therefore, Sunni radical Islam is a vehicle for the exacerbation of sectarian differences and sectarian divides. Again, another contribution to the breakup of these multi-ethnic states. If pan-Arabism was supposed to unite all speakers of the Arabic language without reference to their religious sects, political Islam does exactly the opposite. And there is a modern idea which was taken from the West, which fits into this sectarian struggle and makes it a lot worse. That is the linkage between community and territory. In the Ottoman Empire, communities lived one next to the other without territorial contiguity. Territor territorial contiguity was of little importance in the Ottoman Empire. But under the impact of Western ideas and community and territory, now the sectarian wars of the Middle East are about territory and ethnic cleansing. Take, for example, the genocide of the Armenians in the First World War by the Turks. Take, for example, the breakup of Yugoslavia in the 1990s. Take the breakup of Cyprus between Greeks and Turks. Now in the war in Syria, much of the war between the communities is based on ethnic cleansing. In Iraq, post-Saddam Iraq, Baghdad, which was once a great city of Sunnis and Shi'is living mixed together, there are separate Sunni quarters and separate Shiite quarters, and they have engaged in cleansing each other out of their respective quarters. So the 21st century, in contrast to the 20th century, is the breakup of Arabism and the Arab state. Whereas the 20th century was the construction of the Arab state and the supremacy of Arab nationalism. The 21st century promises to be something very different indeed. The failure of Arabism and Western style modernization meant the failing of Arab states and the warm embrace that people are giving to tradition. And that is what the Arab Spring is all about. The Arab Spring is another round in this 200 year long struggle between the forces of modernity and tradition. It is not about democracy and autocracy. Take, for example, Iraq or Syria. These are sectarian civil wars. It's got nothing to do with democracy. And if it is a fight between modernity and tradition, tradition is represented in political Islam in sectarianism and in tribalism. And now we'll have a look at a few case studies and see how this impacts. This is a topographical map of the Middle East. I'm not sure that it is very clear, but I'll explain what I'm getting at. I, if you can see uh, the Nile Delta, some of you I think won't be able to see it. The Nile Delta, Egypt, Egypt is the Nile. Well over 90% of the people of Egypt 
have lived along the Nile for thousands of years. The Nile, therefore, is not just a source of water. The Nile is also a source of powerful central government. Because of the Nile, and because everybody lives along the Nile, the government for centuries, before the advent of modern transport and other means of modern suppression, the river was the avenue of government suppression. The government could get to anybody, anywhere, anytime. Because the Nile gets to everyone. So Egypt has a very long tradition of two things. Powerful central government and a homogeneous population. Because there always was a powerful central government, minorities never sought haven in Egypt. But if you look at the Fertile Crescent, if you look at this part of the Middle East, it's all mountainous. This is Lebanon and Syria, full of minorities. Because the minorities seek the mountains for their security, away from the, the reach of central government, which always wants you only for two reasons, to tax you and to conscript your children. In Iraq, the southern part of the rivers, Iraq, this Mesopotamia, the country of the two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, the southern part is all swampish area which cannot be the avenue of central government as the Nile is, and southern Iraq became the haven of the Shiites. And the Shiites who lived on the periphery of the Ottoman Empire lived in southern Iraq. And when the state of Iraq was formed, all these Shiites speaking Arabic were included in the Iraqi state. And the Shiites of Iraq were and are the majority. And we will come back to that. So essentially in Egypt, for the last 200 years, in various forms there has been this struggle between the forces of modernity and tradition. And in the 20th century, this was more or less the same thing all the time. The regime against the Muslim brethren. When the monarchy was still in power in Egypt in the 1940s, the Muslim brethren was the largest political organization in the whole Middle East. The Muslim brethren in Egypt had hundreds of thousands of active members and millions of followers. It looked as if the Muslim brethren were gonna take over Egypt. But in 1952, the military conducted a coup, and it is they who kept the Muslim brethren out of power. Until the Arab Spring, the ouster of Mubarak, who was a descendant of this military regime. Up come the Muslim brethren, and then booted out of office by the military, just recently by Sisi. So it's just another round in this long historical struggle. But the Fertile Crescent is a different story. So let us talk about Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. First, to go back for a moment to the French and the British. The French and the British had very different ideas about the Middle East. The British convinced themselves that the Middle East was one strategic arena populated by the Arab nation. That is, the Middle East is the Arab world. There is a thing called the Arab nation. And the British seek to cooperate and to control the Middle East through an alliance with the Arab nation. The French, on the other hand, had a totally different idea about the Middle East. The French argued that the Middle East was not about the Arab nation, but the Middle East was really a mosaic of minorities. And if we look at this with retrospect, it seems that the French had it right and the British had it wrong. But Iraq was constructed according to this British idea. So Iraq came into being as an Arab state, defined as an Arab state. And the British placed one of the Hashemites, 
the family that they negotiated with in the First World War as king of Iraq as a prize for their cooperation during the war. Another Hashemite prince became the king of Jordan. So Iraq was an Arab state. And as the British wanted to cooperate with Arab nationalism, Iraq got its independence very quickly. Iraq got its independence already in 1930. In 1932, Iraq was the first Arab state that was a member of the League of Nations. But Iraq was, as a Jewish Iraqi historian called it, Iraq was a make-believe kingdom. Indeed, over 75% of the people of Iraq spoke Arabic. And only a quarter of the people of Iraq were the Kurds, the Kurds in, in the northern part, the mountainous area of northern Iraq. The mountainous area of northern Iraq. But of the 75% of the Iraqis who spoke Arabic, only 25% were Sunnis. 50% of the 75 were Shiites. And Shiites were never great Arab nationalists. The Shiites always regarded Arab nationalism, and rightly so, as a Sunni vehicle for the preservation of Sunni domination. So they saw Arab nationalism as a vehicle for Sunni suppression, which it was. The Sunnis had dominated Iraq for centuries. And the Shi'is were always the suppressed underclass, which they remained in modern Iraq. The Shiites were systematically marginalized, as they had always been. In 1968, after a variety of political coups and counter coups, the Ba'ath Party, with Saddam Hussein as the strongman, take over Iraq. The Ba'ath Party, this Arab nationalist party is now turned into the effective machinery for Sunni domination of Iraq. Iraq now becomes what one Iraqi called it, the Republic of Fear. Saddam's Iraq, the Republic of Fear, the Republic whereby the Sunni minority suppresses and oppresses by the most uh, toughest of uh, in internal policies the Shiite majority of Iraq. And all this remains true until the US invasion of Iraq in 2003. And the Americans decide that this republic of fear ruled by the Ba'ath Party is the same as Germany ruled by the Nazi Party. And therefore, just as Germany after the Second World War was denazified, Iraq, as you will recall, must be, there must be debathification. But what is the debathification of Iraq? The debathification of Iraq means the overthrowing of the Sunnis and the empowering of the Shiite majority. So the Americans, by throwing out the Ba'ath, which may have been very nasty people, have enthroned the Iranians, who are also Shiites, as the masters of Iraq. Saddam, as bad as he may have been, was the gatekeeper of the Arab East. Saddam in Iraq kept out the Persians. If you remember, there was, there was the great Iran-Iraq war, 1980 to 1988. Well, that was a war that Saddam initiated against Iran because he was afraid that Shiite Iran would subvert his regime through the Shiite majority in Iraq. So instead of Iraq being the gatekeeper keeping out Iran, Iraq, after 2003, became the first Shiite dominated Arab state and entirely in the clutches of Iran. So what is the reaction of the Sunnis? They have been thrown out of a position of supremacy which they held in the area of Iraq for about a thousand years. The Sunni reaction was civil war. And the creation at first of Al-Qaeda in Iraq to fight for the Sunnis against the Shiites. And Al-Qaeda in Iraq became ISIS. 
That's where ISIS comes from. ISIS is the Islamic State in Iraq and Sham. The S stands for Sham. Sham is the traditional word for all of Greater Syria. ISIS doesn't recognize the borders of 1920. Just the name ISIS already tells you what they're after. They are after the destruction of the state system as it presently exists, and certainly the defeat of the Shiites, who now control Iraq and who they would like to push out and keep Iran in its place. So Iraq has essentially fallen apart. The Kurdish part of Iraq, the northern part, has been an independent state in everything but name for more than a decade. And the Kurds not only have their independent state in northern Iraq, they seem to be doing pretty well in pushing ISIS back in Iraq and in Syria too. An important point to notice in these days of what seems to be ISIS invincibility, ISIS loses systematically to people who stand up and fight it. It wins against those who don't fight, that's easy. And when the Iraqi army just folds and flees, obviously ISIS will win. But when the Kurds stand up to them, and the Kurds are not exactly the Soviet Union either, they have beaten ISIS repeatedly. But now we come to the breakup of Syria. The French in Syria versus the British in Iraq. Syria, as opposed to Iraq, really did have a Sunni Arab majority, and they were Sunni, Arab, Muslim, Arab nationalist. <clears throat> they saw themselves as the beating heart of Arabism, but the French did not want to cooperate with that. And the French had a minority policy in Syria. The French preferred the minorities. They preferred Christians in the administration. And the French, in the construct of the colonial army that was built in Syria, did not put Sunni Muslim Arabs into the colonial army. They put the minorities there, the Alawis, the Druze, both of which are breakaway minorities from Shia, and they're not really Muslims anymore. The Alawis, socially, were the, the dregs of Syrian society, the underclass of the underclass, the poorest of the poor. Alawis were so poor and so oppressed by Sunni urban landowners who, whom they worked for that it was common for Alawis to sell their daughters to these landowners to cover their debts. That's where the Alawis were in the 1920s. But it's the Alawis who were a key factor in the army under the French and remained a key factor in the Syrian army after independence as well. Minorities, like I mentioned the Christians earlier on, liked Arab nationalism because it was secular. So the Alawis not only become the officers in the army, they also become the backbone of the Ba'ath party in Syria. And in 1963, in a military coup, the Ba'ath comes to power. But since the Alawis are the masters of the Ba'ath, and of the army. The army and the Ba'ath coming to power means the supremacy of the Alawis in Syrian politics. The Alawis have taken over Syrian politics. This is an amazing social revolution. It is an amazing social revolution in which really the, the underclass of the underclass have become the masters of Syria as the Sunni Muslim majority is deposed from its position of supremacy. These Alawis, who the urban Sunnis used to call these coarse mountaineers, referring to their relative backwardness. So what is the Arab Spring in Syria? The Arab Spring in Syria is not about democracy. It's payback time. The Sunnis want to kick out these coarse mountaineers who have been lording over them for the last 40 years. That's what it's about. And 300,000 people have been killed in this fight because the Alawis are only 12% of the population in Syria, as opposed to the Shiites who are the majority in Iraq. 
The 12% Alawis in Syria are fighting for their lives. And if they lose, they will be hanging from the lampposts. And therefore, Assad is as brutal as he is. And what does this look like on the ground? <clears throat> this is what Assad still controls, the dark red. The dark red is Damascus and the Alawi territory. The northwest coast is where the Alawis live. This is Alawi land. What Assad is trying to preserve is Damascus and the Alawi territory. To hang on to that for dear life, lest the Alawi community be massacred by the Sunnis, ISIS, and all the other hundreds of militias who will eventually defeat them if they do. And therefore, Syria looks the way it does. This is ISIS territory, and this is where the Alawis are hanging on for dear life. And this is why the Russians and the Iranians have now intervened in Syria. It is to save Assad from defeat, and to save the Alawis from annihilation. And they have their reasons. If the Iranians lose Syria, it is a strategic loss of huge proportion to Iran. It is from Syria, from Syria, that Iran prepares for war against Israel. If the Iranians have Syria, they have their link with Hezbollah in Lebanon, and Hezbollah sits over Israel in the Galilee with its tens of thousands of rockets. If the Syrians, if the Iranians lose Syria, they lose the Syrian front with Israel, they lose the connection with Hezbollah, and they lose their capacity to browbeat Israel if Israel attacks them. So hanging on to Syria is absolutely crucial for the Iranians. And they're fighting with a great deal of devotion, one must say, and they, 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 they put their money where their mouths are, as opposed to some other people. The Russians are there for good Russian reasons. The last thing the Russians want is for ISIS to win in Syria. ISIS is full of Chechens who come from Russia. Russia has its own Muslim problem. And the last thing they need is for ISIS and company to have a base in Syria, which won't only work against Paris. It will work in Moscow too. And I'm sure that after Paris, the Russians are doing their homework uh, extra uh, speedily out of fear that this may happen in Moscow tomorrow. But then there are the great surprises. Lebanon and Jordan, two countries that were supposed to have disappeared a long time ago. Lebanon was referred to in the, the textbooks as the precarious republic. Lebanon was founded as a state of minorities. There is no majority community in Lebanon. All the communities in Lebanon are minorities of different sizes. None of them has a majority. Lebanon was not founded as an Arab state. Lebanon was founded as a confederation of minorities, French style, as the French understood the Middle East. So Lebanon's political system was based and still is based on sectarianism. Political power is divided between the different communities in Lebanon according to their relative size. The problem with that is that the size of the communities has changed over time. And Lebanon had great difficulty in accommodating itself to this change. So you had a breakdown in 1958 with a little civil war, and then you had another breakdown from 1975 to 1990 with a huge civil war. But what happened as a result of these civil wars is that the sectarian system remained in place. It's only been altered a little, a little against the Christians and a little more in favor of the Muslims. But the sectarian system remains in place. And I would argue that Lebanon has not fallen apart like Syria and Iraq because Lebanon is based on the reality, on the sectarianism of Lebanese society, which Syria and Iraq never were. They were always based on this false identity of Arabism that didn't really exist and has now uh, fallen apart at the seams. <clears throat> 
But perhaps the biggest surprise of all is Jordan. And go back to have a look at the map. I mean, Jordan is this really odd place. And one wonders why this exists, this big, uh, what they call the duck's bill. The reason why it's there is not because of the people. It's got nothing to do with the people on the ground. It's got to do with the, the range of aircraft in the 1920s. The British needed this for airfields. So they needed this land connection to Iraq, which was their possession too. So Jordan looks the way it does because of uh, British imperial uh, needs actually in the flight of aircraft. So Jordan is an artificial creation. And because it is an artificial creation and may be as artificial or more so than the others, it was always expected to disappear. But in all the Arab Spring and in all this mess going on in the Middle East, Jordan remains the most stable country. The Hashemites who were installed in Jordan in 1921 are still in power. The same regime is in power in Jordan 94 years later. Okay, how come? I mean, there was nothing there in 1921. No cities and no people. 250,000 people in the area of Jordan. But because there were no cities and because there were no people, the British and the Hashemites could build in Jordan a country to their own liking more or less free in their choices and the creation of a political entity that suited their needs. But most importantly, the population of Jordan is not made up of a mosaic of minorities. The Jordanians, like the Egyptians, are Sunni Muslim Arabs. 90%, 95% of the Jordanians are Sunni Muslim Arabs. And there's a tiny 5%, declining 5% minority of Christians. And I would argue that it is this homogeneity, as opposed to the sectarian mishmash of the other countries, that Jordan remains the stable place it is, even with a million Syrian refugees. With a little help from their friends, the Jordanians are managing. So you may ask, but wait a second, what about all the Palestinians in Jordan? There is a Palestinian majority in Jordan, probably, more than 50%. And Jordan is deeply divided between Jordanians and Palestinians. So what is this homogeneity? Well, I would say the homogeneity is not in terms of Palestinian or Jordanian nationalism, but in terms of their sectarian religious identity. Palestinians and Jordanians are Sunni Muslim Arabs, and in a world of sectarianism as it is today, that's what really matters. The social fault line in Jordan is between Sunnis and Christians not between Palestinians and Jordanians, when it comes to the social fault line, that is, who marries who. Jordanians and Palestinians marry each other all the time. But it's always Muslims with Muslims and Christians with Christians. The fault line is the sectarian fault line of the Ottoman Empire. Tradition is more resilient than people think. And lastly, a few words about the countries of the periphery. Yemen and Libya are tribal states that are tearing each other asunder. There is not much left of them as sovereign entities today. Sudan is already divided into two states even officially. Since 2011, southern Sudan is a separate republic. Palestine doesn't exist yet, but there are already two Palestines on the way. Tunisia is the great exception to this messy rule. Tunisia is going through a peaceful transition towards what looks like a fairly stable, democratic uh, new country. So why is Tunisia this exception? Why is it so different? Historically closer to Europe, has had a very strong relationship with Europe. Tunisia is, after all, the outgrowth of historical Carthage. It is, for uh, centuries upon centuries, closely connected with Europe. Tunisia, since independence, was ruled by ruthless dictatorships. But they were secular and secularizing. For what it is worth in a dictatorship like in Tunisia, women and men enjoyed full equality. 
It has a homogeneous population, all Sunni Muslim, very few minorities. But the fact that women had equality in education and in the workplace is absolutely critical in terms of population growth. Well-educated women employed outside the home do not have big families. Non-educated women employed in the home do tend to have much larger families. And a statistic. In 1960, Tunisia and Syria had the same size population, four and a half million. Tunisia today is 11 million. Syria is 23. Syria looks like Syria, and Tunisia looks like Tunisia. It is much more manageable, and it has a society which is much more prone to secular politics, and therefore, I would say, the more successful or the most successful example of the Arab Spring which hasn't worked out so well. And in conclusion, a word about Israel. The crisis of the Arabs and the Arab Spring is not about Israel. We, for a change, are not the reason, and we are not the problem. So what does it mean for us? Ben-Gurion, in 1958, expressed the wish that Israel would be surrounded by weak Arab states. Well, we have it now. You should be wary of what you wish for. But this weak environment is in some ways very difficult to deal with, but I would say in most ways more comfortable for Israel than the Arab world of old when Egypt and Syria had these massive Soviet-equipped armies which we feared would one day surprise us and take Israel. The present threat of the Arabs is not an existential threat. Whereas Egypt and Syria in the heyday of Pan-Arabism were. When Mursi was still in power in Egypt, the president of the Muslim Brethren, he thought of sending the Egyptian army to fight against Assad, to fight for Assad in Syria. Sorry, to fight against Assad in Syria, with the Muslim Brethren, to fight against Assad in Syria. He got a cold shower from the Egyptian public who said, all external wars that Egypt has fought in recent years have been a disaster for Egypt. That is, including the wars with Israel. There is no appetite for war with Israel. Not in Egypt and in other places. We are not at the top of the agenda. So there is a plethora of non-state actors. The states are weak, so there are these dozens of non-state actors. And in many ways, <clears throat> they are difficult to deal with because of the way they fight. This asymmetric warfare that they fight from within their own population against our civilian population. It is a very difficult kind of war to fight. Far more difficult than fighting the Egyptian army in the Sinai Peninsula in 1967. And we have ISIS in Sinai and in Syria and Hamas in Gaza and Hezbollah in Lebanon. But not all of these are focused on Israel at present. ISIS is busy fighting the Egyptian regime, not us. ISIS and Hezbollah are mortal enemies. ISIS are Sunnis, Hezbollah are Shiites, and Hezbollah are fighting with the regime in Syria against ISIS. The bombings in Beirut a few days ago is the work of ISIS against the Shiites of southern Beirut.